Hi, welcome to the IDV and Facility Sequester Data Leaderboard Evaluation Report Out. My name is John Fiskus and I'm from NIST. This evaluation is sponsored by the U.S. government and does not represent any official policies or endorsements. There are five elements of this type. There's going to be an overview of the task and measures. I'll go over some of the results and the analysis, talk about next steps of the challenge evaluations, and finally introduce the next talks of the session. First, the overview. ITV stands for Activities and Extended Video, which is an evaluation series that we've been working on since 2017. In spite of previous efforts on data collections and benchmark studies, we still need to improve performance on human activity detection technology to enable video analytics in applications. Here are some examples of stage scene videos which we are currently using to test systems. The overall goal of ITV is to build better event detection systems. The evaluation supports four key challenges, visible and infrared spectrum video, multiple multi-camera environments, adaptation to new activities, and the effective runtime speed. The evaluation supports two different evaluation models. A take-home evaluation where we bring the data to the system and the sequester data model where we bring the system to the data. This evaluation is a team effort. We developed the evaluation series to support the metrology needs of the IOPA Diva program and the data sets were collected by Kitware Incorporated. The IDV evaluation holds three workshops in different venues. We held one at White B, the Human Activity Detection in Multi-Camera Continuous Video Workshop in ActivityNet as a guest task and then also at TrekVid. The first two are sequestered style evaluations. The latter is a take-home evaluation using the Virat data. Now on to the evaluation tasks and measures. We define the activity detection task to be given a target activity. The system automatically detects the presence and temporarily localizes all instances of the activity in the video sequences. The tempo of lots must fall into a minimum requirement to be counted as correct. The system also produces the start time and end time frames, that's the temporal localization aspect, and then a confidence score, uh, indicating how likely it is that the instance is present. For this evaluation, we define an activity to be one or more people performing a specific movement or interacting with a group of object or objects uh, and other people, and this includes driving. The primary measure of performance for IDV is the normalized area under the detection curve highlighted by the highlighted region in the deck curve graph on your right. The, the, the deck curve is formed by calculating the missed detection probability and the time-based false alarm probability at every point in the presence confidence interval space. And then we take the integral under this curve up to a point of point zero two and normalize that by the total area up to 0 0.02. I'll defer details of this metric to the evaluation plan. We also report other metrics including real-time factor, which is the, the duration of system execution time 
divided by the total video time. And this real-time factor is also used to calculate, the, calculate time limited scorings for each system, where we reduce the output produced by the system if they go over one time real time, which is the target speed for this evaluation. I give you test systems in two important dimensions. The first is facility type, and this is either known or unknown facility. In the known facility case, systems are given access to training material to train activities on and models of the cameras as well. In the unknown facility case, systems never see the video collected at those installations and therefore must be able to adapt to that location. For the activities, there are two types. There's the known activity and the surprise activities. For the known activities listed in the table, systems are given training exemplars, many of them, for each activity. In contrast, surprise activities are given to the system at evaluation time, and the systems must adapt to the new activities during testing. Under the results and the analysis, six teams participated in this challenge, submitting 131 submissions in the six-week period beginning April 4th. The table below shows the lowest NAUDC by team for that period, and the deck curve shows the deck curves for those systems. CMU Diva had the lowest achieved NAUDC of 0.3535, and we had a virtual tie for second between UMD, J2, AIM, and IBM Purdue at 0.4232 and 0.4238. Of note is the UCF system. While we're calculating this normalized area under the curve between 0 and 0 0.02, or 0 0.2 rather, UCF achieved the lowest stream value of 0.65 at 0 0.01 TFA. So even though they didn't do well in the overall average measure, they had a very low TFA. A low PMS at the very low TFA is part of the deck curve. The SDL legal board remains open and active over the last month for about 130 submissions to the legal board. This graph shows the current state of the legal board on June 14th. This challenge evaluation focused on the unknown facility case. This slide compares the data curve for unknown facility on the left to the unknown facility, the data curve on the right. As you can see, the data curve lines for the unknown facility are higher than the lines for the known facility. In this particular comparison, which are mismatched systems, there's a 79% relative increase in NAUDC from known to unknown facility. As I said earlier, we're testing on many activities. This chart shows the activity NAUDCs um, sorted by name. And you can see the variation in performance for the activities and also across systems. I encourage you to dig into the website to get more details about this. In summary, the ActDV series contains many contrastive challenges. The type of activity, the facility type, unknown cameras, and surprise activities and known activities. Um, generalization to the unknown facility remains a difficult challenge, and we're seeing increases in NAUDC of 79%.
The ITV STL leaderboard continues to run. Please go to these URLs and sign up if you're interested. You will need to submit your system via the command line interface. All the documentation is on the website for instructions. And of course, the Maver data is always available. Please go to the MaverData.org website. We're starting a new Slack ITV community. This QR code will give you an invite into the community. Please sign up. The next segment of this recording is a set of participant talks. We have three talks in the top performing teams in the challenge. The CMU, UMD, JHU, IBM Purdue. And we plan to have a Q&A session on June 19th at the Active, Activity Net Workshop. Please see details on the website URL. And now, without further ado, the CMU team. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm here to present Argos Plus Plus, real-time activity detection in unknown facilities with dense spatial temporal proposals. This work is a joint effort from Li Junyu, Li Junqian, Kai Hu, Wen Heliu, and Alexander G. Hauptmann at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm Li Junyu. Here we are dealing with the task of CVPR 2021 Activity Night Challenge Active SDL Unknown Facility. The focus of it, this task is spatial temporal localization and recognition of activities in videos containing multiple instances, large field of view, and multi label activities. It also requires real time processing and deployment because the evaluation is on the system execution. In this challenge, we achieved the first place with an UDC at 0.2 TFA value of 0.35. That's 7% ahead of the run-up system. Here is an overall architecture of our system. We introduce a key intermediate concept of spatial temporal cube proposals. Given a video frame, we use object detection and tracking to do spatial localization, which then we use in proposal generation. For efficiency concerns, we use background subtraction to filter proposals, and then we deal with the classification problem of activity recognition. Lastly, we use activity deduplication to merge the small cubes and define the temporal boundaries. For proposal generation, we use a frame level detector to process downsampled frame sequence and then apply multi object tracking algorithms. Previous works of detection of 3D segmentation based activity detection usually uses uh, spatial temporal tube proposals where the whole trajectory of each tracked object is used. It still requires temporal localization and containing variable bounding box shapes across frames. Here we propose to use spatial temporal cube proposals. It's simple yet powerful by defining the boundaries in three dimensions, x, y, and t. Then it comes to the problem of handling untrimmed videos, where multiple instances can occur. Previously, people tend to cut into non-overlapping clips with stride equals to duration, but this suffers significant performance drop at boundaries, despite its simple implementation. Now we propose dense overlapping proposal sampling, where there is no literal boundary. It's a strict extension of the previous one by setting stride less than or equal to duration. Here is an example of proposal generation. Here is the input. We focus on this car. And we sample in overlapping temporal dimensions. After that, we refine the spatial localization of each proposal by extracting the seed track IDs from the central frame and enlarge the bounding boxes as the union of its tracklet. This way it's robust through identity switch in the tracking algorithm while ensuring the coverage of moving objects. This way we do not rely heavily on the tracking algorithm. Then to leverage motion information instead of only objects in the image, we do proposal filtering with foreground segmentation. After the nice 
cube proposal generation part, the activity recognition falls back to a multi-label classification problem. We use the binary cross-entropy laws weighted by proposal scores, and we balance activity-wise positive and negative samples, balance the samples of different activities and different datasets. Details will be covered in the experiments. Later, as we use small cubes of activities in overlapping fashion, we need to remove the duplicate activity instances. And for each activity type, we perform the following algorithm. First, we split into length equals thread with the average score and intersection of bounding boxes. Then we get a sequence of small, even smaller cubes. We can merge them back altogether, but for this challenge with the specific metric, we merge them back into length equals duration, uh, larger boxes, and then we select the cover with the maximum score. This way, it's like performing an interpolation upon overlapping cubes, maximizing the information utilization while removing the repeating ones. In this section, we will discuss the results and the experiments we did in this challenge. In this year's challenge, we won the first place on SDL unknown facility track. Compared to the other teams, we have almost seven points better on PAODC and around five points better on teammates. Overall, we have submitted eight systems to the leaderboard. The best system achieved 0.35 on PAODC. It is a fusion system. The best second system is a single system which achieved 0.36 on PAODC. In this challenge, we have tried different training sets with different splits. Here we show all the training sets we use in the challenge. Uh, generally, we use two different data sets, MEVA and PIP. In MEVA data sets, we use the KF1 and DROP1 to DROP7 annotations provided by Kitware. In the PIP data sets, we use the first drop of uh, 157k annotations. Uh, we also map the 66 classes to 37 MEVA classes in the PIP data set. Hi, I'm Yijun Chen. I'm very honored to introduce the lessons we learned in our experiments. First of all, we found the MEVA data set is seriously not distributed. You can see here in this figure for both TF3 S2 and TF3 S1, the number of activity annotation instances vary a lot. Uh, to solve this, first of all, we implemented a weighted binary cross entropy loss, which called WBC, in which two weight parameters are adopted the activity wise weight WA and the positive negative weight. WP. WA balances the training samples of different activities and WB balances the positive and negative samples of a specific activity. Uh, so here we show the definition of these two parameters and with the definition of these two ways, the derivation of our loss function is also shown here uh, in which SGN represents the signal function and C represents the number of actions to classify. Compared with Molina BCE loss, we found WBCE loss can significantly improve the Final performance on both internal validation set and online UF leaderboard. We also try to do a data augmentation with the PIP data set provided by STF. However, the videos in PIP data set are web videos and they are slightly different from the high resolution civilian videos in PF3. So a single mixture training um, won't improve the performance. And to solve this, we designed uh, uh, balanced uh, action wise sampling strategy. Uh, here is the experimental results. You can see the first line is a baseline, and we try pre training on PIP and mixture training with PIP3 annotations, but both doesn't work. Uh, however, if you do uh, uh, action wise balanced sampling strategy, we can find although the performance on internal validation set is still two points worse, but it's three points better on online leaderboard and it improves a lot for the PME's metric. Um, to do this, we will balance the number of instances to use in from PF3 and uh, PIP in each Apple train. However, for different Apples, we will use different instances from PIP annotations to make full usage of uh, the data set. Finally, we replace our loss function with our WBC loss and improves uh, two points for ODC and one point for PME's. And that's our optimal setting. We also try some filtering. Firstly, we try a 1.5 TFA for video filter, and it works for all of our submissions. For example, here, the first system is trained on PF1 and uh, PIP, and the second one is trained on only PF1. We can see the filter 
uh, words on both submissions. We also notice that uh, there are some missing annotations in the ground truth. For example, here the red bar is a ground truth annotation, and green bar is the prediction of our system. Um, we can see all the people around this table are picking up something. However, the annotator has only annotated one of them as a ground truth label. And according to the criterion of metric, we will lose lots of points uh, according to this kind of missing annotation. So uh, we add a count filter to limit the uh, simultaneous uh, prediction number, and we can find that it improves around uh, one point for UDC on the leaderboard. And I, we think it demonstrates our assumption to some extent. Finally, uh, we found systems trained with different data set settings have different performance on different actions. So we do an action-wise uh, fusion. And you can see here, uh, through fusion, the two systems, we improve two points for UDC on the leaderboard. And that's our uh, best submission for this year's challenge. Finally, here are some takeaways and the lessons we learned through this year's challenge. And yeah, I think that's it. And thanks all for listening. Next up is the system paper from UMD J2, delivered by Josh Gleason. For our real-time action detection system, we use a two-stage approach. In the first stage, we quickly produce action proposals to reduce the large spatiotemporal search space by pruning regions of the video where we can quickly say that actions are not occurring. In the second stage, we process the proposals with more care, predicting which activities are present in each proposal. In the following presentation, we will present the details of this system. Since this system is an extension of the system we presented at the HADCV 2020 workshop, we will focus primarily on improvements since then. Our system uses different proposals during training and testing time. At test time, we use a machine learning based proposal mechanism. The backbone of this proposal model is a low resolution segmentation model using an I3D encoder. The model takes uncropped segments of video as input and predicts voxel level activity presence. The loss function used to train this system is a combination of dice loss and binary cross entropy. To produce cuboid proposals, we take axis aligned bounding boxes around blobs detected using connected components applied to the model output. To train the classifier, we use a different proposal mechanism. This proposal method uses a publicly available implementation of the MASK RCNN object detector trained on the COCO dataset. To perform proposal generation, we apply agglomerative hierarchical clustering on the human and vehicle detections in space-time. The resulting clusters are randomly selected from different levels of the cluster hierarchy, producing a wide variety of long and short and large and small proposals. The reason we use this approach for training, rather than the data-driven model used during testing, is that it provides more uniform coverage of the video. Especially important is the generation of hard negative examples. This allows us to train our classifier with a wider variety of training examples, making it more robust. Furthermore, since the proposals are not learned from the training data, we believe that the resulting model will be less likely to have biases that may be present in the data-driven model. Before moving on, we will examine the behavior of the scoring method used in the ActDV sequestered data leaderboard. The final score is based on a trade-off between time-based false alarms and probability of miss. First, we will look at time-based false alarms. Consider the example on the left. Suppose that the blue bars correspond to the ground truth annotations for a particular activity type, and the orange bars correspond to the activity instances predicted by the system after applying a confidence threshold. To compute the time-based false alarms, we first compute the total number of instances present in each frame as shown here. We then count the total number of surplus instances predicted across all frames of a video. The time-based false alarm value is proportional to this count. Considering how TFA behaves in certain situations can be quite insightful. For example, consider the cases in the table to the right. In some cases, even though the prediction does not perfectly match the ground truth, we find that TFA is still zero. Of particular interest is the disjoint split scenario, where we have split the prediction into a disjoint set of predictions.
The other measure involved in the final score is probability of miss, which is computed as the ratio of unmatched ground truth instances. Matching is performed such that each predicted activity instance may be matched with at most one ground truth instance. Furthermore, the match must have at least one second of overlap with the ground truth. This means that it is very important that all the predicted instances are at least one second long. The matches are assigned in the way that minimizes probability of miss using the Hungarian algorithm. Similar to TFA, we can observe the following cases where p-miss is zero despite imperfect predictions. Looking at these two measures together, we can see that the evaluation metric does not penalize two interesting cases, specifically the shortened and disjoint cases. If we split our predictions into disjoint instances that are at least one second long, we can mitigate the risk of accidentally combining instances. In fact, the shorter we make them, the more we mitigate the risk, and with very little downside. This is particularly important in the case of activity types that often have multiple overlapping instances, such as person enters scene through structure. On the other hand, if we were to split the proposals into exactly one second pieces, then our classifier has the tendency to produce errors due to the limited duration of the input. To get the best of both worlds, we take each proposal and split it into slightly longer overlapping segments, giving enough temporal duration for the classifier then shortening each of the proposals after classification so that they are no longer overlapping. While our proposal generation is based on RGB input, we use optical flow for input to our classifier. Specifically, we use the GPU accelerated TVL1 optical flow built into OpenCV. Empirically, we have not found a better input mode. In fact, even two-stream flow plus RGB performs slightly worse and is much slower than flow alone. While it is difficult to definitively say why this is, we hypothesize a couple of reasons. The first reason is that activities tend to be background invariant. While this invariance may be learnable given enough training data, optical flow acts as an implicit background subtraction on the input, thus making our classifier background invariant. The second reason relates to the fact that optical flow captures fast relations occurring over only a couple of frames. Counter this to the 3D convolutional model, which operates on a subsampled set of frames where fine-grained actions are lost due to the downsampling. By using optical flow along with the 3D convolution network, our model is able to act on both fast and slow relationships in the video. We have also discovered that multi-label inference, predicting multiple labels for each proposal, works much better than softmax. Back when we started on this problem, this wasn't the case for our system. We believe that the shift has occurred likely due to the quantity of training data that is now available. We label each proposal with all the ground truth instances that it overlaps with. To determine overlap, we use two thresholds, one for spatial intersection over union and the other for temporal overlap. We use overlap in the temporal domain rather than IOU because the shortened proposals after splitting are generally not long enough to have high IOU. When training the classifier, we sample 50% of the training examples from negatives that overlap no ground truth instances, and we sample the remaining training examples approximately uniformly with respect to activity class. After classification is completed, we apply a number of post-processing steps to produce the final output of our system. For each activity type, we first select up to one proposal per second of video, prioritizing by higher competence proposals. Since we support multi-label classification, we may produce multiple activity instances from a single proposal. We then apply proposal shortening, as described earlier, to ensure that the overlapping pieces coming from an original proposal become disjoint. Finally, we apply 3D non-maximum suppression in order to remove repeated detections of the same instant. In practice, we have found that making the non-maximum suppression extremely aggressive works best. Once all of these tasks are finished, we produce a final system output file. For training, the UMD JHU group has released 193 hours of annotated training data. This data contains two components, cuboids and inner boxes. Inner boxes are per-frame bounding boxes that encompass all the objects that compose the activity, while cuboids are spatio-temporal bounding boxes that contain all the inner boxes. 
our system uses both of these annotation types. For the data-driven proposals, we make use of the inner boxes for their higher degree of spatial precision. And for training our classifier, we use cuboid-level annotations when labeling training proposals. We also make use of the kitware-provided MAVA annotations, which can be accessed at mavadata.org. In conclusion, we have presented our UMD JHU AIEM action detection system that placed second in the ActivityNet 2021 challenge. In summary, this system was a significantly improved version of our HADCV 2020 system. The primary improvements since then were the use of data driven proposals, the use of multi label inference, the development of score-motivated proposal augmentation, and a significant improvement to the training data and quality of the annotations. This concludes our talk. Thank you. Next up is the talk from the IBM Purdue team. Hello. Today we are going to talk about how to train a generalizable system performing well on sequestered data. This presentation is on behalf of IPM and Purdue teams. Let me jump into the agenda. First, we'll make a recap on our system and show updates we introduced to it. Then we will cover an important topic of data enrichment, followed by a dive into our strategy to fine-tune models. Finally, we explain how we ensemble to models to obtain our results. So our system works the following way. The input video is cut into three second chunks and is decomposed into frames, which are piped into object detection model. Then we apply a 3D non-maximum suppression to the boxes around objects of interest and enlarge their sizes to create an action cuboid that serves as input to a classification model. In our previous system, we used an ensemble of two TSM models. This time, we substituted one TSM model with R2 plus 1D model. The multiply of two scores is used as a prediction for an action class. Here, I'm going to talk about how we get the training data to train the model. We are using really scalable mu annotation to get the training data. For its activities, the square keyboard was generated from an annotation, randomly padding from beginning or end to reach at least 96 frames. The data was split by camera ID to simulate the unknown fertility of an area. There is one important aspect here, how we generate sample for background class. To generate the background class sample, object detection was used to detect the candidate object and the motion filtering is applied to fill out the static object. Since MIMA dataset is heavily unbalanced, some activity categories only have two subs. We are using PIP250K dataset to balance the dataset. We manually select the partials to make the label consistent. The dataset from PIP was randomly split. We generate two different datasets to train the model. The first one, the MIVA data, is well balanced from PIP. That means after balance, each class has a similar number of samples. In this case, majority of the whole dataset comes from the PIP. The second variance of dataset is we just select small number of the sample from PIP. In such a case, each class is still in balance, but each class have minimum 500 samples. We use these two data sets to training 
TSM model and Auto plus 1D model. Let us briefly explain how we fine tune our GSM model. We decided to use cross validation approach on MIVA only data to choose one to unfreeze D players. We found that unfreezing all except inner batch normalization layers after first epoch brings best result. MIVA data is highly imbalanced. So we experimented with loss functions. We tried focal loss, label smoothing cross entropy, complement cross entropy, class balance wrapper for focal loss and cross entropy loss, and finally using simple cross entropy with different class weighting strategies, which turned out to be the best option. Then we experimented with optimizers and parameter optimization policies. We tried Adam, T Adam, R Adam, and other belief, with other belief being most successful. The following step was to choose a proper scheduler and its hyperparameters. So we tried cosine and needing, cyclic learning rate, one cycle learning rate with different base learning rates. One cycle learning rate, scheduler proved to be the best one. Final tuning of hyperparameters was performed by submissions trained on balanced dataset version 1. Our experiments resulted in approximately 40% improvement on local data and more than 10% on sequestered data. The use of enriched dataset and the final hyperparameter tuning like way decay and submission epoch resulted in another 10% improvement on the leaderboard of a standalone TSM model. In pure slides, you can talk about how we find tune TSM model. Here I'm going to talk about how we find two R2 plus 1D model. Two R2 plus 1D model we applied IP session and AR session to meet the real time requirement. The checkpoint we are using is Instagram 65 mini. It's, from our experience, this checkpoint outperformed other checkpoints. To fine tune the model, we try to different the parameter tuning. The first slide is loss function. We try the fork loss and cross entropy with different class weight. Different class weight strategies yield a different performance. The smooth one gets a better result. We also try to different optimizer like SGD ways with the characterization are Adam and Adam belief. Adam belief gives a better validation result, but this better result doesn't need a better need a performance on need a bird. However, the SGD with the weight decay get better need a better performance. We also try the different learners schedule like a coursing, an innings, and a one cycle learning rescheduler policy. The one cycle learning scheduler policy yields the best result. All the parameters and fine tune training by the balanced data versus uh, version 2. That means each class has a minimum 500 samples. For our submission and the performance data board, if we get a better validation result locally, normally it get a better performance on the leaderboard. Here I'm talking about how we sample TSM mode and the Auto Plus 1D mode. The relative processing time for Auto Plus 1D mode is 0.45. TSM mode will be faster, 0.15. To to sum them together, we generate generate cobalt from 96 video frames. Uniform sample 32 frames or the input of R2 plus 1D mode 80 frames.
for a KSL model, we choose a very simple strategy to sample the output of each model, like addition, multiplication, or we can select a model based on the performance of each activity category. From our experience, multiplication is outperformed the other method. Here there is some result. From that, you can see these two modes complement, complement each other for some activities. We get a better result for NAUDC and the PMIS after ensembling. The stranding time is still faster in real time. Thank you.